Good morning, Ms. Glenda. Ms. Glenda. Thank you. Good morning. You may proceed. May it please the court. My name is Michelle Granda. I represent the eight plaintiff couples. The reverse evasion law forces municipal court clerks to apply laws that are unconstitutional here at home. It sat on the shelf unused for decades and was dusted off for an expressly unconstitutional purpose to stop as many same-sex couples as possible from marrying here. Counsel, does the record tell us when it was last enforced, if ever? According to the record, there's no proof that it was ever actually enforced, aside from listing Section 11 itself on the list of the notice of legal impediments to marry. That's the only sense that the record shows that it's ever been enforced. Uh, what, what did the notice of legal impediments contain? The notice of legal impediments contains the impediments to marry in Massachusetts. It lists consanguinity uh, uh, impediments. It lists age impediments. It lists all the reasons why someone could not marry in Massachusetts. And on that list is simply the plain language of Section 11 itself, which says that a, a couple who resides elsewhere and intends to reside elsewhere cannot marry here if their marriage would be void if contracted in their home state. Does it list Section 12? That's, that's Section 11. Does it list Section 12? It does not list Section 12. It's never list Section 12, and even to this day it does not list Section 12. One of the things that happened after Goodridge, or really because of Goodridge, is that the Commonwealth turned on a dime to set an entirely new enforcement scheme in place. This enforcement scheme not only brought this law to life, but it did what it never had done before, which is list every state's and bring every state's laws into Massachusetts to block not only those whose marriages would be contracted, it would be void if contracted, but to block everyone who could not marry in their home state. That's simply not consistent with the terms of the statute. There's Does that do that with respect to consanguinity? The consanguinity uh, restrictions in Massachusetts, you must meet those to marry in Massachusetts. Then the law, the section, the reverse evasion law would look to see whether, in addition to meeting Massachusetts requirements, whether you also meet your home state's requirements. What's different, so yes, the consanguinity restriction of another state would be applied through this law if, in fact, it were different than what Massachusetts consanguinity restrictions are. But what makes this case different is that we know, after Goodridge, that the Commonwealth cannot use its formidable authority to bar same-sex couples from marrying because they're same-sex couples. When our Massachusetts officials apply other states' marriage bans against same-sex couples here in Massachusetts, they engage in the same type of discrimination that was declared unconstitutional in Goodridge. Well, no. it's a little more complicated than that, isn't it? Uh, you're here on a preliminary injunction? Yes. Which um, requires balancing of a likelihood of success with re irreparable harm? Yes. And your arguments are twofold. First, constitutional in various ways, privileges and immunities and equal protection and that kind of collective enforcement and that kind of stuff, correct? Yes. Um, and as to that, there is a problem, I think, with your position because the majority opinion in Goodridge did not hold marriage to be fundament a fundamental right. Did they? Is, isn't that correct? It's correct that they didn't use that language that it's a fundamental right, but certainly Goodridge recognized that there is a right to marry and that same-sex couples should be able to participate in the right to marry on the same terms. Well, has the Privileges and Immunities Clause ever been applied to anything other than a fundamental right? The Privileges and Immunities Clause, what's, what's fundamental under the Privileges and Immunities Clause is different than what's fundamental for purposes of equal protection. That's what's fun true. That's true. Yes. So what's, what's fundamental for the Privileges and Immunities Clause is simply what is basic and essential and what would interfere with our cohesion as a nation were it to be denied. In what case of the United States Supreme Court says basic and essential? Basic and essential rights 
is, comes from the Baldwin case, and it also, the, the Baldwin case, which dealt with elk hunting in Montana, but that case also looked back to Corfield, which said that things that are, would be basic and essential in the sense would be the pursuit of life and liberty, as well as the pursuit of happiness. Goodridge recognized in Article I, which recognizes the pursuit of <coughs> happiness, that marriage is a part of the pursuit of happiness. It is partly of how we define ourselves and how we, we, we measure our lives and our relationships and mark that relationship with the world around us. Nothing in Goodridge says that our officials can discriminate simply because other states discriminate. It is a bedrock principle of Massachusetts law that visitors to Massachusetts can benefit from the protections of the Constitution while they are here. In Commonwealth versus Aves, a child who was born into slavery was able to come to Massachusetts and partake of the protections of the Massachusetts Constitution to be free from slavery while she was visiting Massachusetts, even though Ms. her home- Ms. as you know, the Attorney General's response to that argument is that there was no intervening statute. Indeed, I don't believe there was any common law in Massachusetts at that time, although there could be a dispute as to that, as to whether or not Massachusetts uh, had any view about slavery in other states. That's correct. I don't believe that the distinction that the Commonwealth makes is meaningful because the Constitution ultimately trumps whatever statutes exist or whatever common law exists. If it is a, a, a violation of the equality and liberty protections of our Constitution to deny the right to marry to a same-sex couple simply because they are of the same sex, then that prohibition would infuse the Massachusetts Constitution and prevent laws from being enforced here, tolerated here, or affirmed here that violate the fundamental principles of our Massachusetts Constitution. Could so, Massachusetts make residency a, a requirement for marriage here? I think that setting resident, uh, a residency requirement for marriage could raise complicating questions under the Privileges and Immunities Clause. What is true is that no state has residency as a requirement for marriage. Only five states have ever even thought of enforcing other states' impediments within that state when it comes to marriage. But and how does that square with uh, Sosna versus Iowa, which really says, at least in the context of a divorce, <clears throat> a state surely can require a one-year period of residency before someone can take advantage of the state's divorce laws? I think Sosna is best understood with respect to ensuring that the court has jurisdiction over the parties so that its court powers would vest within that decision. That has nothing here. If, if you look at Sosna when they talked about intermeddling, at the time, 48 states had residency requirements for divorce. Here, no state has a residency requirement for divorce. Nor has it ev ever had any residency requirement. Correct. Nor have they ever had any residency but requirement. there's no suggestion that there will be a residency requirement here, correct? Excuse me? There's no suggestion that there will be a residency requirement. There's no reason to suggest that. We let non-residents marry here all the time. The Commonwealth is, even in, within this case, the, the governor has come forward to say that non-residents pose no harm to the Commonwealth. Can I pursue a, uh, another point with you because your time is beginning to run down? <clears throat> your argument is also statutory, is it not? Correct. Uh, and that statutory argument is not in the other case brought by the clerks. There, there's, as I see it, is purely constitutional, right? I believe that the clerks have asserted a statutory argument well, as well. Okay. Well, let's concentrate on statutory argument for a minute. As I understand it, it says under Section 11 and 12, um, you can deny these licenses only if the out-of-state provision statute declares uh, the marriage in the out of in the other state void. Void, we know in uh, legal terms, is a very very narrow concept. You furnished us with the statutes, I think, of all 50, uh, 49 other states, and a lot of them don't use the word void. They use voidable. Am I right? Not permitted, prohibited, and so on. Um, some states have enacted the Defense of Marriage Act, have they not? Yes. Well, well they have enacted laws that prohibit marriage for same-sex couples within the state, and some go as far as to deny recognition. Well, what I'm leading up to saying, or getting your position on, and the Attorney General's position on eventually, there would be, would there not, in your, in your mind, a, a group of states where the marriages would be recognized notwithstand because they're not void in those states. In matter of fact, has not the Attorney General of Rhode Island and the Attorney General of New York say, said they'd be recognized in those states? 
That is true. There has been some indication from other states that the marriages would be res uh, legally entered marriage here would be respected. But I don't think that recognition actually matters at all. I think recognition is actually a red herring for three reasons. And the first is that the marriages are valuable to these couples and their children, regardless of what happens with recognition elsewhere. These couples get 100 percent of the rights, benefits, and protections of marriage when they're here. They're also, for the second reason, residents are in the exact same position when it comes to recognition. We don't take away their licenses at the border, nor should we deny non-residents licenses when they're in the exact same position as our residents on the other side of that border. And the third reason that comes to your question about the statute is that the reverse evasion law was never designed to guarantee recognition, and in fact it doesn't further the purpose of recognition. It was solely designed as a belt and suspenders approach to enforce other states' evasion statutes. I, I see that my time is up, if I may finish. You may finish. Only designed to enforce other states' evasion statutes, so that if Alabama were to declare a marriage void, if contracted outside Alabama, other states would, who agreed to this compact would also prevent that marriage from happening elsewhere. The, the statute itself turns on whether the marriage will be void if recognized in the other state not on whether the marriage will be actually recognized or on any other recognition or non-recognition law of the other state. We know, based on the conflicts of law brief that's been submitted in this case, that void and prohibited are not proxies for non-recognition. Too many states provide spouses with legal rights, even if their marriage will be void or prohibited in that contra if contracted in another state, and even facing what seemingly were insurmountable public policy. So recognition, I think, is really a red herring. The question is, what does this statute really do? And we know that the statute, what it does not do is force other states to do anything that they don't want to do. Marriage with or without this statute, and it's different than SOSNA, marriage with, with or without this statute does not force any other state to make a decision on marriage that it's not uh, within its desire to do. Ms. Glander, let me ask you a question. This statute, which was this cluster of, of provisions, uh, which was adopted in Massachusetts in 1913, was not an ad hoc, quick in the, you know, in the middle of the night drafting. This went through many, many, many revisions, as uniform laws done by the commissioners generally does. Um, and I under, and I've read, you know, the legislative history that you provided to us. The attorney general, of course, takes the position that you have to read. Section 11 void and Section 12 um, not prohibited as, in a sense, parallel provisions as, as to how you define who may have access uh, to a marriage license in Massachusetts. Why is that not a reasonable reading of the statute? Well, it's, it's not reasonable because it's not consistent with the entire overall scheme. If you look at the word void in Section 11, it, it is carried through the statute as it was enacted Sections 12 said if the marriage would be prohibited, and then section, what, what is now Section 50 said if the marriage would be thus prohibited. It was only when Section 50 became non-sequential when it was codified that Section 50 then said prohibited by Section 11. It's clear that the language in Section 50 when it was enacted was intended to refer back to 11. That informs our reading of 12. Also, just the way that it makes sense that there would be a different understanding of what prohibited means because it's a different subject than the subject that's in this, the statute on Section 11. Section 11 refers to marriages that would be void. We would never refer to people who would be void. We refer to people who would be prohibited. Those people who are prohibited are those whose marriages would be void. So the only way to keep this statute consistent with its purpose, which was to buttress states' evasion laws, is to enforce it as to void. If we enforce it beyond void, we're looking at a situation where we may be stopping marriages that other states would recognize and actually would allow out of state. So we would be guessing as to what other states want to do. We know here that these states have the power to enforce their own laws with or without the reverse evasion statute. And Massachusetts need not prejudge that issue, need not interfere. We need not do the dirty work of other states. If they choose to treat same-sex couples badly, they should do it on their own terms and not make Massachusetts affirm or tolerate a policy of discrimination simply because the other states have these laws. Aves wouldn't allow that, and I don't think this court would be uh, wise to follow that pattern. May I have one more question? You may, Justice. Uh, I, I want to go back to the purpose of the uh, marriage evasion law in 19. 
12, was it intended to prohibit interracial marriage? It's a great question, Justice Ireland. The legislative history does suggest that one of the pro prohibitions that would be enforced by this law would be prohibitions against uh, the, the intermarriage of whites and non-whites. That's definitely part of the legislative history. It is, it is, it is, at the time, that was the biggest impediment. 30 of 48 mm -hmm. states at the time had these laws. The, the, one of the major things, though, that comes through in the legislative history as well is just the desire to enforce the impediments of other states with respect to other impediments. The desire, for instance, to enforce nisi periods after divorce so that a couple who was divorced who couldn't yet marry in their home state could not go to another state to marry. So it's, it's, the, the goal was to prevent couples from, from relying on the general rule of marriage recognition, which is if your marriage is valid, we're celebrated, it's valid everywhere. That's the general rule, and only our interpretation of the statute would apply that general rule to make that possible as to all marriages that have happened in Massachusetts. Thank you, Ms. Glander. Thank you. Mr. Bott. Thank you, Justice Marshall. Your <coughs> Honors, my name is Kevin Bott. I represent 13 clerks appointed or elected from communities across the Commonwealth who are here because they've been ordered to be agents of selective enforcement of the reverse evasion statute. I'm following up a bit on Justice Cordy's question. If we were to declare this statute invalid, what impact, if any, would that have on any of our divorce residency requirements? Uh, this statute has nothing to do with the divorce no, residency I know, requirements. No, I know this statute doesn't, but I mean the analysis that we might use. Once again, uh, there's no um, – divorce residency requirements have to do with, as uh, my sister colleague mentioned, enforcing court orders as to support, as to child support and visitation and the like, and having those orders extend to other states. Uh, and there needs to be some jurisdiction aspect to that, to, to courts from other states recognizing those orders. And there's an interest in Massachusetts in having a residency requirement for divorce for those purposes. That same analysis does not apply to marriage, which is, of course, many benefits, some of which may be enforced down the road in courts, but the benefits and protections and obligations of marriage, which are freely portable from every state uh, and has, have always been, are quite a bit different than the, the more narrow kinds of issues that come up in divorce Should that have court proceedings to enforce them. Shouldn't we uh, take up, you argue, the statutory ground also? We argue the statutory ground as part of the selective enforcement. The, the, could, you, the could you explain the selective, from your point of view, the Attorney General insists that this is not selective enforcement? Uh, the Attorney General, well, the Registrar has tried to put a, a, a uh, veneer of equal enforcement on this law. As a practical matter, the way the selective enforcement works in the clerk's offices is two couples come in, a man and a woman, two women, the clerk looks at the notice of intention form of the man and the woman, sees their out-of-state residents, then administers an oath, shows them the impediments in their own home state, administers an oath. That couple takes the oath if they're from one of 16 states. There's no way of verifying that there's a mental infirmity and capacity impediment. Nine states, a physical incapacity, communicable disease impediment. Several states, impediments due to chronic alcohol or narcotics abuse. But that would be true in the home state, too, isn't it? Whether or not you recognize somebody as <coughs> mentally incompetent, uh, you, you, you know, based on a piece of paper that they submitted to you. you, you the, the home state clerk we, has the same problem. There's nothing in the record, nor has the attorney general or the registrar provided the clerks with any way of verifying these kinds of <coughs> impediments if, they're, if they are, in fact, verified at their home states. If, if a heterosexual couple comes in uh, and says to the clerk, we're brother and sister, um, from, we're from X state, would the clerk marry the, uh, give those people a license to marry? No, they would not. The consanguinity and age possible impediments are 
uh, they're in the rules to be policed. Most of the other impediments it, are not. Under Massachusetts rules. A and age is, of course, under Massachusetts rules, something that is a qualification anyways. And the other states only deviate. I think there are three states that deviate from the age requirement of 18 years old in Massachusetts. Would, 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 would it be an answer to, at least a partial answer to this case from your point of view, also the Attorney General may want to comment on this, to take up the statutory ground first on the premise that you don't reach constitutional arguments if there is some statutory basis on which to solve this, to look at the <coughs> other 49 states and call out of them the, the states that do not use the word void in their statutes, which I <coughs> think is almost all of them, and say as to those states, uh, the 1913 statute could well be inoperative and therefore licenses ought to issue to residents who come in from those states and then leave it to those matters to be litigated in the other states when they, uh, you know, end up either getting divorced or suing for benefits or whatever it might be that would raise a case in the other states. Would that be an answer? So if I understand your uh, question, <laughs> Your Honor, if the reverse evasion of statute were to bar only couples whose marriages are void in are the other void. state, Expressly for accepting your interpretation. That would, certainly, that would certainly give relief to some of the couples before you. That would certainly well seven out of eight, wouldn't it? To the couples here before you, um, many of them that is true, and it would certainly give the relief to the clerks that they seek, which is clarity in terms of how. Now, as to, to that, there would be no need for a trial <laughs> because there are no facts to determine, are there? I mean, this is pure statutory interpretation. Uh, I think that's right, Your Honor. Most of the facts are before the court in the record. Well, as the Attorney General has agreed, uh, you know, which is not surprising, uh, that void is a serious step that should be taken unless the statute requires it. So the Attorney General, for those – I'm not suggesting the Attorney General agrees with the statutory interpretation that says it's limited to void, but if it is limited to void, I think everybody is in agreement with what void requires. Namely, that it be present in a statute. Yes, Your Honor. I think there would still be a further question this court would have to uh, mm -hmm. ask itself, and that is, if even an even-handed neutral statute were applied even-handedly, uh, if it's motivated by a discriminatory animus, as this one, there is direct evidence that it is, That's and an it has a the implementation of the statute. That's a different. The, are you talking about the implementation of the statute? It, 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 if I may anal, analogize, analogize this to the voting rights cases, if you have an even-handed statute applied even-handedly, its impact and intent is to disenfranchise a certain class of uh, uh, people, and this was the case in voting rights cases in the South, then that is still a violation of equal protection law. Well, that's a constitutional claim, but what, but what I'm saying, that, that claim which is made by the clerks, the selective enforcement piece, has to do with contemporary enforcement. It doesn't have to do with the enactment of the statute ab initio, correct? The selective enforcement, if the elements of the selective enforcement, uh, particularly the overbreadth, the sweeping breadth of applying this to all states, were, were cut back by this court, then there would be a more even-handed application of the reverse evasion statute. You're, you're <coughs> absolutely right, Your Honor. But then, I don't think that then solves Then what the they problem. may or may not be, following Justice Glaney's uh, line of reasoning, then they may or may not be a constitutional claim for, for those couples, non-Massachusetts residents, same-sex <coughs> couples, who state an intent to marry in another state which has on its books a law that says um, marriage between same sexes is void. There may be a remaining constitutional claim with respect to them. There may be, Your Honor. And unless the state advances reasons to justify <coughs> that uh, discrimination, um, <coughs> then it still uh, runs afoul of equal protection. <coughs> Going back to the <coughs> excuse me, the statutory point. <coughs> Some of these states, in fact, a lot of them have out of state, have adopted the Defense of Marriage Act, have they not? 
Uh, yes, Your Honor. I, there don't are see the, I didn't, at least in my first trip through the briefs, see anybody talking about how that fits into this. I mean, suppose the other state, we'll say it's Kansas, uh, statute doesn't say void, says not permitted, uh, but they've enacted the Defense of Marriage Act. What do you do with that? Your Honor, I think what you're referring to is what th has the moniker of mini DOMAs, Defense of Marriage Acts. Well, yes, they take a variety of different statutory forms right. and statutory language. There is no single uh, uniform Defense of Marriage Act adopted by states. I, I take it what you do in those circumstances, assuming that we interpret, assuming that we interpret the Massachusetts statute to apply only to those states that prohibit that that state that same sex marriages are void is that you, you then revert to um, classic conflict of interest rules, which is you look to see what the claim is. The claim it's not a it, it might be a declaratory judgment of somebody who holds the same a marriage and is a same sex couple going into a, a state with a mini doma saying I want you to declare my marriage valid. That could be one scenario, but it might be. Um, a child seeking a support order from a, a, an adult where the child was the product of a marriage mm -hmm. and there's no requirement, there's no request for Kansas or whichever state it is to recognize the marriage. It's simply asking the child saying, I would like um, some child support for, from this um, in a spouse of I, I think that is right, Your Honor. The amicus brief on conflicts of laws speaks of uh, re certain states, even with restrictive policies against same-sex marriage, very possibly, although it's quite uncertain, recognizing certain incidents of marriage that were of marriage celebrated in Massachusetts, as Your Honor suggests, perhaps a child support order, even if otherwise the that state would not recognize the marriage for all incidents. It might recognize it for the purposes it may, it may of not hospital even visitation. Have to, it may not even have to recognize the marriage. It may simply enter a, a support order. Absolutely. I mean, it could go on any number of grounds, de facto parent, whatever it is, but it may determine that it is in the best interest of the child, of this a child, to receive child support from a somebody absolutely. Who, who has obtained a marriage license in Massachusetts. And, and that is why I suggest the reasons, the so-called interests of the state that have been advanced here, uh, whether or not they're legitimate state interests, do not outweigh the harm inflicted on those couples, even if they come from states who are quite uh, uh, restrictive in terms of the recognition of same-sex marriage, because there are some benefits that even those couples would receive from a Massachusetts marriage. Certainly the intangibles this court has articulated in Goodridge, certainly they can go to their schools of their children and seek, even if a court wouldn't enforce it, <laughs> recognition of that marital status. Can I ask you, where does this weighing come in? If we're looking at this law to determine whether there's a rational basis, what, what, if there's a rational basis, legitimate basis for the law, what are we weighing? Under the standard in Goodrich for an equal protection claim, it was whether there was a legitimate state interest that outweighed the harm inflicted on the class that was being discriminated against. But the, the Attorney General makes the argument that um, one of the uh, basis for this statute is that we should not be interfering in the laws and actions of other states. Now you've just, I think to some extent, made his argument. If, if we recognize, if we um, give licenses to these out-of-state couples and then they adopt children either here or back in their own state and, and then um, there are, there's a separation or a divorce, why should that other state have to deal with the result of our statute, which is what gave rise to the child in the first place. Well, we, we would be imposing a problem on that other state. Your Honor, when Massachusetts same-sex couples who are resident here now and married here now travel or migrate to other jurisdictions, these same problems will come up. The reverse evasion statute does not keep that problem from having to arise no, in the courts of other states. It, but doesn't that provide a rational basis for the statute, at least the same-sex couples who get married here who are resident here? <clears throat> we have a legitimate basis for dealing with them. 
we've, we've said that our citizens can, can enjoy those benefits. But what right do we have to impose that on people who just happen to come here? Once again, I don't think we are imposing anything on those other jurisdictions which are well capable of addressing whether it's a, one of their own residents with a Massachusetts marriage license or one of our residents that moves There's to that state. There's nothing that requires a second or third or fifth state uh, to do anything, correct? It does not require any state to do anything. As it's I, not as I, understand, as I understand the brief, it, it's notwithstanding fairly clear language in some states, courts nevertheless have, for example, gone ahead and in cases of polygamy, anti-miscegenation, uh, post-divorce, there were lots of statutes on the books that said if a woman had divorced, she couldn't remarry, she did remarry, notwithstanding a clear public purpose, the state could choose whether or not it wanted to enforce certain aspects. There's no requirement that it do so, correct? There is no requirement in, any, in issuing a marriage license here that another state treat it in any way whatsoever. And in fact, the same thing has arisen with respect to civil unions, as I understand it. Some states have said, we don't recognize civil unions, but we will issue orders with respect to child support or... Uh, you know, other forms that are incident to those uh, licenses, and some states have said we will not do that. That's right. Iowa and West Virginia have dissolved civil unions from uh, Vermont. And other states have declined to do so. And other states have declined to do so. Thank you, Mr. Butt. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Sachs. Good morning, Your Honor. Peter Sachs, Assistant Attorney General for the State Defendants. I'd like to first address uh, briefly Justice Ireland's question and then get to Justice Graney's um, various questions about statutory interpretation and whether that might simplify this case. Um, there was a claim made below that there was a uh, racial motivation behind this law as originally passed in Massachusetts. That's uh, been waived, hasn't it? Uh, it has been waived. It was quite thoroughly refuted, I believe, in our preliminary injunction papers in the Superior Court. The Superior Court rejected it. The couples have not pressed it on appeal. To the extent it is a concern to this Court, I would invite the Court uh, to do what it obviously has the right to do, which is to go inspect the Superior Court papers, and particularly our preliminary injunction opposition. I just don't think the history supports any such claim of racial motivation here in Massachusetts, and that's the critical point. Uh, secondly, on the issue of whether uh, statutory interpretation might narrow this case, um, assuming, uh, first of all, that Section 11 were the only operative provision here, which we strongly dispute, uh, Section 11 refers to marriages that are void under the laws of other states. The Defense of Marriage Acts and other statutes and constitutional amendments that uh, other states have adopted sometimes say same-sex marriage is void. Sometimes they say only opposite-sex marriage shall be valid or recognized. Sometimes they say uh, same-sex marriage is invalid. Um, to me, a statement in a constitution or a statute of another state that says the same-sex marriage is invalid is equivalent to a statement that it's void. How, and how we do could you, go down... How do you square that with your statement in your brief, which I found revealing? Which is, in has, fact... The void has... We, we actually have a quite... I mean, not in this case, but over time in other contexts um, have said that, um, uh, that if it's void... Uh, you, you say unless the statute requires it. I took that to mean uh, <coughs> void. And then your footnote, by the way, I did not agree with your footnote because I think when a state official engages in conduct, as in California, the mayor of San Francisco, where a state, state official engages <coughs> in conduct, which the law in that state says, not for purposes of um, uniform laws, but in that state says you can't do this, you cannot issue a housing permit you know, more than three feet from the line, and the state official says, well, I think that's unconstitutional. Those acts are void. That's not leading void well, into the statute. What the court said there, those are two, two limited states, clear. but the court said that the marriages were void. Well, because, of, because yes. of the actions but of the state officials, it, it, it would be no different than... They were said they were void ab initio. Yes, but I think the, looking at the larger because the point, state official look, had acted in a way which was inconsistent. Looking at the larger point and interpreting Section 11, if a marriage would have no legal effect in the uh, state of the couple's residence, then Section 11 says uh, it uh, should not be performed here. And whether that statement of uh, no legal effect is made in the home state by saying only opposite-sex marriages are valid or same-sex marriages are void, 
or same-sex marriages are invalid or equivalent language. <coughs> so you, you don't... Uh, I don't think void is a magic... Great. Right. Void is not a magic word. In no, your, I agree that there's a distinction between void and prohibited, but I think there are other ways that states what express do you do the concept of void. Is yeah. it true that the attorney generals of New, New York and Rhode Island have indicated they would grant reciprocity to these marriages? Or there they, there has, have been suggestions in the uh, opinions of those attorneys general, um, but the issue of recognition of, an out of, of a uh, Vermont civil union is currently pending in uh, in New York Appellate Court in a case called Langan versus St. So Francis those opinions, Hospital. in your your view, would not be decisive or worth much well, weight if, until such time as either the legislature of those states or the, well, I guess the legislatures have already spoken, but the highest courts of those states rule. Well, those op uh, opinions only go to recognition, not to whether same-sex marriage is void or prohibited Mr. in those Sachs, states. Hasn't, hasn't the history of this particular <coughs> statute been that uh, for which we have to take some notice, not the application perhaps in Massachusetts, but the history in the early part of the century when it seemed to be enforced, more, be drawn upon more frequently, was that if there was a marriage uh, entered into State A which was prohibited by the laws of State B, that many courts faced with a marriage from State A, because we, we live in a very mobile it didn't say we hereby yes. recognize the marriage. They looked at what the claim for the yes. relief was. Sometimes it was a property interest, yes. for example. Um, sometimes it was often child support. Um, uh, sometimes it was something quite different. Yes, they did, and that's the point of the amici conflict of laws brief. But what we have now, which differentiates this case from those, is positive laws in many, many other states that expressly deny recognition. But there were positive to, laws. <laughs> no, <laughs> not me. positive laws that expressly denied all recognition didn't to somebody the cite a, of the didn't somebody With cite respect, Mr. Sachs, there were positive la laws that denied all recognition, particularly to interracial marriages, and denied uh, recognition to marriages well, that were entered into by a spouse, typically a woman who had divorced during the li and sought to remarry during the lifetime of her former husband. I, I can say, Your Honor, that of the cases cited by the plaintiffs, I have found no case in which there was a law uh, of a state that expressly denied recognition to an out-of-state uh, interracial marriage. Does there were certainly laws in those states that said um, we don't permit that sort of marriage here. And, of course, those were invalidated in Loving v. Virginia. But there was no uh, recognition statute at issue in those cases. I, I searched those cases. If the, if the plaintiffs can find one, then that would strengthen their well, case. One, one was what we have here now is many states, and in the past five years, past ten years, um, <coughs> prompted by DOMA in part, have enacted express non-recognition statutes. So well, those we are, don't engage in the sort of general the, balancing of conflicts. Uh, those are the many DOMAs, right? Yes. Uh, he calls them many DOMAs. Those are the state DOMA statutes. Yes, and they strongly correlate uh, making a marriage, uh, same-sex marriage, void or prohibited in the home state and not recognizing but, such marriages from other states. You, and you that's why you can factor out those DOMAs. I mean, you know, you can figure out which states have them. I mean, that's very easy. That's just a research project. And then you're left with a fairly large group of states that don't have them. Uh, well, I would disagree that you're left with a fairly large group of states. Uh, by our count, and as set forth in Addendum B of our brief, uh, we've got, uh, at the time of filing, we 41 other states, Puerto Rico and the District of Columbia, have statutes or constitutional provisions that most likely deny recognition to out-of-state same-sex marriages. Plaintiffs make no claim there's any state that currently allows them. And since then, we've had con the Connecticut Attorney General weighing in based on the civil union statute there. Mr. Sachs, let me, let me ask you this. I can understand as a matter of where, you, where one addresses one's resources, but marriage in Massachusetts is not confined to Massachusetts residents, correct? No. Anybody from any place in the world can come here, correct? <coughs> yes, what if happens? they can get married in their home state. Or home so jurisdiction. what guidance is the Attorney General giving to people who come from Ontario versus Alberta versus Germany versus? <clears throat> well, I, uh, this illustrates how Sections 11 and 12 work. If you come from a jurisdiction where same-sex marriage is prohibited, such as the seven Canadian provinces or Belgium or the Netherlands or Spain as of July 3, 2005, then Sections 11 and 12 leave you perfectly free to enter a same-sex marriage here. And, and when so the registrar the, the gets registrar, the registrar has not been given any guidance, so in some ways citizens well, 
that is to say that there's an open dispute as to whether it's void or not void, but citizens in the United States, same-sex couples seeking to marry in Massachusetts are being treated somewhat differently from people who come from some other part of the world, correct? Yes, but that's true with respect to opposite-sex couples, too, in the sense that the registrar hasn't undertaken to uh, prepare a list of impediments to marriage in every country in the world and furnish that to clerks. Doesn't that go to the selective enforcement point? No, because he hasn't done that for opposite-sex couples either. What happens in those cases, and this, this issue was not raised below, but as we say in our brief, if it had been raised below, we would have filed an affidavit saying that when the registrar gets calls from clerks saying we have a couple here from another country, uh, what, can they get married here? Then the registrar connects that clerk with the appropriate consulate or embassy so that the question can be answered. It certainly raises no question of selective enforcement because those issues can arise uh, with respect to opposite sex couples as well. And when they do, they're treated the same. So uh, there's no, no basis for selective enforcement there. So, 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 so that if, if an opposite sex couple comes in, uh, and discloses some information on the form, uh, degree of consanguinity between the applicants for the license. The, the, the clerk will go check what the requirements are from that state. Uh, if, the, if the marriage, I take it, could be performed in Massachusetts but could not be performed in the other state, a license is not issued. That's correct. The clerk is t uh, to go look at the impediments list that the registrar has issued. And even if the opposite sex couple swears on their notice of intention form, that they know of no impediment in their home state, if the clerk comparing the factual information on the notice of intention to the notice of uh, list of impediments from that other state sees that there's uh, a mismatch, sees that there is an impediment, the clerk should deny the license. And that's for an opposite sex couple as well as for a same sex couple. And clerks have clearly been instructed to apply the same Can rules. Can I ask you one more question on the statutory point? Yes, I'd I'll like to get back to section 12. <coughs> and then I'll stop talking about it. Um, <coughs> Since this is here on a preliminary injunction, if, if we accept their interpretation of 11 and 12, you know, assume that, yours is different and yours may perfectly well be valid uh, too, in which case this whole thing is uh, different. But if we accept theirs, uh, is there any, would there be any factual issues that would have to be tried or would the case then be appropriate for a resolution on the statutory point on summary judgment? Uh, no, so I'm preliminary injunction. I, I'm not aware that there are factual issues, but you would have uh, the laws of other 49 states that would have to be examined. We've done as complete a job as we could in our chart. Okay, in the so of who, doing who that, would do that job? Would we say the attorney well, general should do it and issue, you know, an well, opinion yeah. saying this is good, this is good, this is good, this is not good, good, good? Well, I think you have the defendant's view in the uh, in addendum B. If you're looking for differentiation between. Uh, void and prohibited, that would require a good deal more work. And these raise questions under the laws of other states, and there may be some uh, consideration given to whether other states should be given a chance to, to weigh in on whether they interpret their laws, because it's ultimately a question of their state's <coughs> law. If, if uh, mar marriage, if same-sex marriage or any other kind of marriage is well, void or prohibited is under the law right. of another state, <coughs> then that triggers What I'm saying is analytically, at least to me, this is different than the usually usual preliminary injunction case, because the ordinary preliminary injunction case you know, leaves a case to be tried on, on facts. Right. And we here we have, have issues here. of law. We've got all these kind of metaphysical concepts yeah. floating around in other states. So <laughs> whose duty would it be to implement well, any kind of injunction that was issued? Well, uh, Yours? I think the injunction would have to, I think the, I, I hesitate to suggest this, but a court has to make a determination of what, um, which other states' laws trigger the operation of Sections 11 or 12. Um, I don't think the, d the plaintiffs are going to be satisfied with the Attorney General's um, interpretation. Uh, they're clearly not now. I don't know why they would be afterwards. And since it is a question under each of those other states' laws, um, then, as I say, some consideration needs to be given to whether that other state should have an opportunity to say, does, does our, does Colorado's or Wyoming's or, or whatever other state's law or constitutional provision that says same-sex marriage is invalid or only a marriage between a man and a woman shall be valid, does that mean that same-sex marriage is void? Because it's a question of their state law that Correct. triggers ours. That's, that's, that's classic conflict of law. I, I, Mr. I, I, Mr. Sachs, let me ask you this. The, Ma the Massachusetts Constitution prohibits refusing access to marriage to same-sex couples, correct? Um, um, only on the same terms as opposite-sex couples. That was what Goodridge said. You can't, there's no rational basis for denying 
uh, same-sex couples access to marriage on the same terms as opposite-sex couples. And Sections 11 and 12 apply the same rules to opposite-sex well, couples as they do so to same-sex couples. So we held that as a matter of, that's a constitutional imperative. Yes, that it's irrational, we, that particular we, distinction. We do not distinguish between residents and non-residents. That's correct. Why do we not proceed to say we do not, <coughs> you know, the protections that are afforded to same-sex mm -hmm. couples Marrying in Massachusetts are the same as those to from whether they're in state or out state, and leave it to all of those other states to figure out what their conflicts of laws are. Well, because, because you have simply given me, I mean, I what I have to do. Let's assume that I have to make a determination. I accept your invitation that the attorney general's view may not be acceptable, and the court has to decide that. What I have to do is to go to look to see how that state would apply its own conflict of laws. It is not a, I, I cannot do that. I don't believe unless I have a case or controversy. I have to know what the issue is. I have to really know what the issue is because I'm not assuming that everybody's going into the other 49 states for a declaratory judgment. That's my problem with this mechanism. I simply have to know, because the history is so clear. Yeah. Re respectfully, Your Honor, I don't think this case requires a conflict of the laws analysis because the other states have adopted express provisions denying recognition to out-of-state marriages. One doesn't have to engage in the sensitive balancing of interests that is the subject of the conflict of laws professor's amicus brief. Other, and, and they acknowledge this in a couple of scattered places in their brief. Where there's a positive law about recognition, a positive choice of law provision, then that's the end. You don't get into an analyzing public interest, public policy, the relative interests of the various states. Where there's a rule that's been adopted by the legislature or the people of another state, that's the, the choice of law rule that's followed. And as we demonstrated in Addendum B, uh, virtually every other state uh, is going to deny recognition to same-sex marriages from this state. Um, if I could, I'd like to talk about the, the rational bases that support doing so. And, and why Massachusetts has a legitimate interest in enforcing Sections 11 and 12. First of all, we have a legitimate interest in avoiding the risk that out-of-state couples uh, will come here to get married, return home, reorder their financial and personal affairs, have children, and then the spouses and the children are hurt when those marriages turn out to give them no enforceable rights in their home state. It's very difficult for them to come back here and enforce those rights. Massachusetts has a legitimate interest in not causing harm by creating a situation where, where people are going to uh, have children in a state where their relationship gives them and the children no enforceable rights by virtue of the marriage. Um, secondly, we have an interest recognized by the Supreme Court in Sosna v. Iowa in respecting other states' laws, in uh, avoiding what the court called officious intermeddling in affairs in which other states have a paramount interest, that is, the uh, status of marriages between residents of those states. That is an interest of Massachusetts itself in avoiding meddling in the affairs of uh, other states that have a greater interest in the matter. Um, and that correlates with avoiding uh, a backlash from those states, uh, friction with those states. If we say, we don't care what your laws are uh, prohibiting your residents uh, from in, in, uh, getting married, we're going to marry them anyway and let you deal with the problems. That's not the way a state should act in a federal system where states owe respect to the laws of other states. We, we may not like their other laws. We may not like other states' laws about same-sex marriage, but we can't change them. Indeed, if a, a rational legislator looking at these laws could think that these actually further the cause of same-sex marriage because if we, have, uh, if we allow people from all 49 other states to come here, get married, return to their home states, and uh, produce a wave of, an increased wave of litigation uh, over uh, uh, same-sex marriage in those states, we could easily face a backlash from those states. There is a federal constitutional amendment that has been proposed and uh, is, has been proposed again in this session that would ban same-sex marriage everywhere. If we produce a backlash, the, inc the chances of that uh, marriage pa of that amendment passing are increased, and that will harm uh, Massachusetts same-sex couples. So we've got respect for other states' laws. Uh, we've got avoiding meddling in the, the affairs of other states. We have another interest recognized as legitimate in Sosna v. Iowa, which is um, avoiding uh, creating court judgments in Massachusetts that will be collaterally attacked and vulnerable uh, in other states. 
and um, the residency requirement that we have for divorce is not sufficient to protect against that here because uh, under the Defense of Marriage Act, uh, other states have no obligation to recognize uh, Massachusetts divorce judgments in the case of same-sex marriages. So Sosna v. Iowa said it's a, a state has a legitimate interest in the recognition of its divorce decrees, and um, sections 11 and 12 serve that legitimate interest. And to answer Justice Cowan's question from earlier, if you strike down sections 11 and 12, then you're rejecting both of those rationales in Sosna, the uh, avoiding meddling in other states' affairs and uh, uh, protecting the enforceability of Massachusetts divorce judgments, and you thereby undermine the rational basis for um, the divorce residency requirements. So those uh, Mr. requirements Sachs, would become in, vulnerable. In, in Sosna versus Iowa, the, the court says a state such as Iowa, Iowa may quite reasonably decide it does not wish to become a divorce mill. Is there a difference between divorce and marriage for these purposes? Could I substitute the word marriage here, and, and is the result necessarily the same? Uh, th that's not a phrase that we chose to include in our brief, mm -hmm. but I don't disagree with the, the logic of the question, Your Honor. I don't see. There's no difference between marriage and divorce for those purposes? I, I don't think so, because, particularly because um, the, uh, where a marriage will not be recognized in other states, uh, if a, a problem develops uh, either within the marriage or uh, outside of a marriage that uh, implicates marital rights, but those rights are unenforceable in another state, um, we're going to have the kinds of problems that we had, that the, the court uh, found in Sosna and that, that the court said were legitimate bases that for having for Iowa's. Massa that is true for um, marriages that occur in Massachusetts. I'm sorry? That is true for, for same-sex couple marriages that occur in Massachusetts. You mean if those couples go out of state? Uh, yeah, we are a highly mobile society. And one yes, we are, but there's a difference between um, Massachusetts couples moving out of state in the ordinary courts, which is fine and which may ultimately lead to greater acceptance of same-sex marriage elsewhere, and uh, in which I we thought have thought difficulty thought, limiting. I thought, I thought because your earlier argument was it would cause a backlash. Uh, no, I'm sorry. I said that what would cause a backlash is if Massachusetts essentially thumbs its nose as the, at the laws of 49 other states. And what makes states. you think that this is a thumbing its nose? Well, it, Massachusetts can't prevent <laughs> same-sex married residents from moving out of state. That would raise significant uh, right to travel issues. Uh, but inviting couples from 49 other states to come here and get married um, because they can't get married in their home state presents a significantly greater danger of backlash by other states and retaliation by other states. Other states understand that we can't uh, stop our residents from traveling. This or sounds moving like wherever a nice political like. track, Mr. Sachs, but I'm not sure that there's any evidence to support it either way. Well, the question is whether a rational legislator could believe <coughs> that sections 11 and 12 have this effect. Uh, and uh, a rational legislator who wishes to advance the cause of same-sex marriage could believe that sections 11 and 12 actually do that by letting other states uh, deal with this issue in their own due course through their own judicial and political processes. Mr. Sachs, can you tell me uh, if the record tells us when this law was last in the <coughs> courts? Um, so, uh, the record doesn't tell much before 1976 because it was at that point that the Registrar of Vital Records and Statistics was transferred into the Department of Public Health. Um, before then, all we know about the statutes is that uh, Section 12 was the subject of, well, both Sections 11 and 12 were the subject of two requests for opinions of the Attorney General. They came from the Secretary of State, but they were essentially on behalf of the Registrar under whom the uh, because the registrar served under the secretary. So we know that the registrar was paying attention to both of those statutes. One was in 1936, one was in 1973. In both of those instances, uh, the attorney general uh, answered the question in such a way that made clear that he did uh, view Section 12 as imposing a separate requirement from Section 11. He interpreted Section 12 as saying, if that's, your marriage is spelled, prohibited is in your home state. No that is spelled out no belief. But those, yes. those are the only two occasions where he was asked for advice, correct? Mm. Yes. Are, are vital yes. records kept uh, by, by clerks uh, so that we know uh, mm. somewhere, anyway, w whether or not somebody came in and applied for a marriage license and was rejected for X reason? Uh, the, the records are kept, uh, as, at least as transmitted to the state. I, I don't know that uh, notices of intention that were rejected at the local level would be kept. I, I so just don't know the answer to, to that question. So with respect to Justice 
Ireland's question with respect to enforcement, the answer is the record is silent on that we, point. We don't know, except that we have these two uh, no, Attorney General's opinions. opinions. And, but even if there had been no enforcement, uh, this Court has made clear, as recently as the Fitchburg gas case last year, and particularly in the uh, Doris versus Police Commissioner of Boston, that lack of prior enforcement of a statute does not create some kind of estoppel that bars the government from enforcing uh, a law, particularly if new circumstances Mr. arise, Sachs, as they I have I don't here. think that was the suggestion. It was simply a factual question. Yes. When was it last sorry, enforced? Yeah. The, honor, the answer is, I don't know. Correct? That's correct. Thank you, Mr. That's Sachs. correct. We'll take a short break. Thank you. All All right. Right.